I haven't been live streaming in a while. I do live stream. My name is Miguel Coronado. I'm in Austin, Texas. I'm an illustrator, and I'm striving to become a more financially backed illustrator. And uh, <clears throat> you can find me on Facebook, facebook.com slash I-I-I-M-C-I-I-I. You can find me online. My website is www.mciii.net. My username on Instagram and uh, conceptart.org and Crimson Daggers and like uh, I think pretty much any social website is Mike086. So uh, I try to keep that the same across the board. Um, let me just kind of gather up some stuff here. Just kind of gather my thoughts. But I'm going to talk about the uh, Massa Black. LA workshop, excuse me, which I just got back from, and I want to just answer questions people might have, or if no one's going to ask any questions, I'm just going to talk about my experience because it was the first workshop I've been to, and uh, it was kind of mind blowing, and uh, no, not mind blowing. I guess a better word to say is very inspirational and very much. Uh, like one of the most important steps I've taken doing freelance illustration if not the most important step besides starting and practicing is that going to this workshop was like one of the most important steps so anyway <clears throat> we'll start off um, let me pull up a, a window so we can kind of look at kind of what was going on at the workshop and I could kind of explain what I was doing and where I was coming from in my mindset while I was there um, I just gotta find my Safari window. Here we go. So I'm going to open up a new tab. Let's just look up the workshop real quick. And I'm just doing this so I can uh, kind of have a point of reference to start from. So for me, going to this workshop, I think one of the main, one of the main uh, goals I had initially before I before I actually went there, one of the main goals I had was to like uh, receive feedback in person from various professionals, and uh, that was it really. It was just receive feedback, and then I think uh, meet people in person and kind of get a good foot down with other artists so that they know I exist and I know they exist and that if they didn't know I existed already they'll know who I am now right I guess really though <clears throat> I didn't plan on any of that all I planned on was going there to get my portfolio reviewed and uh, say hi to the artists that I kind of you know look up to and just that have helped me out I want to kind of pay it back and say thank you um, and then uh, oh just and then just to socialize with them um, <clears throat> that was kind of my secondary goal so the first goal was to receive feedback and if there was any companies besides Riot Games that were going to be there I wanted to just uh, kind of get my portfolio my name in front of them and uh, and then uh, I'm sorry I'm just trying to find uh, the web page for it here we go Um, and then meet the artists that are that are there to instruct and kind of surround myself with them. So that was my secondary goal, but really that summed up to like uh, I wanted to at least go out and have dinner with some of the instructors, right? At least once. But uh, it kind of turned into a little different, uh, different kind of a atmosphere, a little different attitude once I really got there and saw how everything works. It quickly became. Um, from receiving feedback and wanting to connect uh, a few of the instructors and talk with them it uh, it turned into me just wanting to talk with everyone almost non-stop and just n keep hanging out with people and I think the main thing I wanted to do is talk about anything but art 
just to talk and see how these people are and who they are and talk about movies or other things. And we, there's nonstop talk about art and illustration, of course. But the main thing I wanted to do was just <clears throat> while I was there, like stay up and talk with people, you know, about everything nonstop and just uh, you know be in the crowd be seen and be known um and i think that it's there's a select group of people that are doing that and then there's a there was some people at the workshop that they probably were staying in a different hotel but there was some people i definitely weren't seeing uh on a nightly basis and you know they must have you know they might have different goals they might already be professionals they might just be there to catch up with their old friends but um anyway oops started the wrong program I'm trying to find the chat um, alongside with the uh, meeting people, um, I like on the first day of the workshop, I kind of quickly made the decision that I wasn't going to be sitting in on any particular uh, session that first day, um, and there's a big reason for that, and that main reason is that everyone it's just out and about milling um, from one demo to a next to the next demo <coughs> excuse me and to just be stuck in one place for a while unless there was a, a real reason for it um, like if there was some session that was just going to be invaluable to me or just that I really felt like well you know I paid for the ticket came all the way here I wanted to see this one guy talk in person I stayed you know but uh, overall, it was just uh, the first day. It was more important to me to just walk around and talk with people, um, you know, everyone, not just the instructors, but like everyone. Um, so yeah, um, the first day quickly became talking with everyone, kind of hushed whispers. Everyone was kind of just saying hello, introducing themselves. Um, every now and then, we'd all stop and go sit around one of the demo areas and just kind of watch for a bit <coughs> and I think everyone was kind of getting into the groove of the workshop uh, for anyone who had the, for anyone that had a, their first workshop experience it was a little new in regards to how to approach the instructors especially in the main room the main room has big screens and the big screens are facing basically a pit of chairs and you sit and here, I, let me illustrate it for you. Oops, crap. All right. And let me try to break down how this works a bit. So, uh, let me just create this new file. Okay. All right. So, like the main room is uh, here. God damn it. Hold on. Everything's like delayed for sec some reason. Okay, undo that. The main room is here, and if you've already looked at the, uh, if you've looked at the website and seen the layout, you've already, you know what this is. So I'm just gonna kind of explain exactly how it looked. Ah, crap. Right, and also I haven't been using Photoshop for five days straight now, so I gotta like remember everything. Not really, but you know, you know what I mean. It's just something I. And these are all chairs. Like this block represents a group of chairs. Okay. And, uh. <laughs> These are, uh, okay, so these are curtains. These uh, these lines of drawing are actually just curtains. They're not like an actual room, and they're not an actual like on the itinerary it says room, but it's not a room. It's just a giant soundstage. Um, it's just a giant soundstage with um. <coughs> Uh, 
with curtains, curtains set up, and uh, so all these walls are just curtains. Like every wall here is a curtain. This little block, this represents chairs. So that's like these are chairs. Right? I do they're dotted lines or something. Whatever. Um, then on the other side, this is not to scale. Uh, let's see. On the other side, there's um, more curtains, but uh, also, let's see. Curtains, curtains, curtains. And these are curtains. Right, so that's that's the whole layout. And I'll explain it a little more. Okay. What just happened here? Oh my god, not um why did it erase? It's supposed to show the opposite color. Oh it turned it into layer zero. Flatten image. Okay. So this was like the entryway to get into this area. It was actually big. It was like it's just a big open thing. Or well, maybe it wasn't that big. Whatever. Um, and then these curtains. There were more curtains. And uh, it's one, two, three, four. There's four rooms. Yeah. Four rooms and two areas. This is a traditional area. So they had like a screen. And then like easels, easels, easels. And then uh, they had like another screen here and it was like easels, 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 model, uh, Karl Kapinski, <laughs> he was just right here the whole time, um, more stuff here, these are all the easels, right, okay, anyway, this is all curtain, so anyway, you gotta imagine, and the reason I say that, the reason I'm even talking about this is because it's kind of important, um, it's important in the fact that like I um, you know when I saw the layout I was I was imagining some kind of maybe office area or some kind of room some kind of building where they rented it the space and like uh, it actually had rooms but it's actually a giant open sound stage and then you come in here and it's just black curtains and there's a sign that says room 4 which lots of people didn't realize was room four. Room one, two, three. This was traditional. And this was, uh, I call it demos. It was digital, but like, um, it was a different vibe from the traditional. Because there was more people just sitting and watching the demos, and then traditional there were people with their sketchbooks or their canvases painting and working so this was more like a demo digital area and some people had their computers out but most people just sat and watched and took notes <laughs> so anyway that's the area this is what it was so like if you imagine this giant empty building and there's just these giant black curtains everywhere and you know that's it there's a bunch of chairs here and uh... every day people would file in and start sitting here um, and yeah so let's go back to what else kinda gotta get a good feel of what I'm doing here um, like I said before ask me some questions uh, I learned a few new techniques um, in Photoshop that I did not I did not go in knowing about or I just there are things I have heard about but I just never used but uh, overall, the main, some of the main information they pulled away from this workshop was uh, kind of what I want to focus on is in my work, which is illustration. And um, when I say I want to focus on illustration, I mean I want to shy away from sole, um, solely doing like concept art and really focusing on illustration as my practice. And then from there, I can branch out if I want to in the future.
but I want it, my background to be illustration versus uh, concept art, right? Um, and there's some reasons why I just got like why I came to that decision, but this workshop has pretty much helped me decide that. Um, okay, so first day everyone's everyone's here watching these screens, and so like I think on the very first day you had like. Um, Jason Chan was here. Uh, Dave Repose is here. I'm just doing this from memory. Uh, this is Wes Burt. WB. Dave Repose. Jason Chan. Um, who is here? Crap, I can't think of who was here. Um, <laughs> uh, the first day is so long ago now. Uh, I have an itinerary, I think, somewhere. I had an itinerary. Maybe I lost my itinerary. That kind of sucks. Anyway. So, to get an idea... Oh, that's right. This was Mitch Morehauser. Mitch Morehauser, Dave Raposa. Westbert, Jason Chan. Um, this was. Uh, who was this? Crap, crap, crap. Instructors. Schedule. Pardon my. Pardon the wait. <coughs> screen one, screen two. Uh, Alexi, that's right. Alexi, Alexi, Alexi and Knox, that's right. So, this was Alexi, and this was Knox. And basically, in the morning, you come in and you all sit in this big area. Um, and then. They bring in all the instructors and they say, "Welcome to Master Black. This is a great experience. Welcome, yada yada." Here are the instructors. Here's they're going to introduce themselves, and they, everyone says a brief, like one sentence about themselves, like, "Hey, my name is yada yada. I do this, and I'm excited to be here." And they put the artwork behind them, so you can get an idea of what they look like and the artwork. And that's a huge, that's a huge important thing to know. The artwork with the person because lots of people I met there I think there's about five or six people who were there that I was already friends with on Facebook I follow their artwork but I haven't ever like looked through their album or anything to see what they really look like and on top of that I hadn't really chatted with anyone on Facebook like I'm friends with a few of the people I met there already but I never made the effort to like message them and say hey I'm an artist you're an artist we should hang out and chat, you know, online. Um, I just didn't do it. Um, I don't know why. There's absolutely no reason I shouldn't have done that. But anyway, the facts are I didn't. Um, but it's the same with them too. Like there's lots of people who just follow the work of the other artists, and they they never took the time to like message any of the other artists and actually chit chat for a while. Um, but now I've met them in person. It's much easier to see someone's art up and know that that's your friend that you met. And like it's your friend's artwork. It's not just this random dude from like Sweden, you know. Uh, so after the demos, after the in introductions, um, the very first day after the introductions, you, everyone goes to lunch. And uh, the first day wasn't so good for lunch because it was just massive lines. And uh, I think. Um, it was pretty soon after the lunchtime. I ended up skipping. I grabbed just like a, a drink and a snack because I wanted to just I wanted to grab lunch later. I didn't want to miss the demos. But the time I came in, Dave Raposa was sitting here. He had started working, and Mitch Morehouse had started working. So I missed the first five to ten minutes of their drawing, and it, it was huge to to miss it, um, just because Dave had already blocked out like a whole. Uh, portrait and Mitch Morehauser had like blocked out all the shapes and forms already. Um, 
but everyone else filed in a little later after lunch was over. But anyway, so one of the important parts is that uh, of this workshop and going here was learning that it's really free form. It's really kind of just a, you know, these guys were eating lunch. They came in around the time they were supposed to come in and started working. And they're all in Cintiqs, and they're all sitting here. And uh, the first day, uh, almost no one got up next to them to talk. So they just they were pretty much just working live with people watching. And that changed. So like as the day as the days progressed, this mass of chairs uh, became uh, unorganized and more organic in regards to. Um, became an organized and more organic in regards to uh, um, what do you call it the instructors that were demoing and uh, the fact that you're able to walk up behind them and talk with them while they're demoing and it, it just it feels a little awkward because of the way it's set up the very first day it was very much like to go up behind them was like a So the chairs ended up kind of like forming like this. Everyone moved the chairs to get really close. Like they were like within feet of the instructor after like the first few days. And then we had some chairs here. And there was like chairs here. And there was like a few chairs here still. Because some people just wanted to sit and watch. And then these chairs were moved up closer. And then like this was another one where all the chairs were just like encompassing the instructor. And there was a few here. And then some people were like right here sitting next to them. It, depending on the instructors, people would come up and just sit and chat with them the whole time. And it's basically, when that happens, you basically get a one-on-one -on -one chat with uh, one of the instructors. And it's completely okay to sit there and have a one-on-one -on -one chat with them while they're working. Because if no one else is doing it, why not do it yourself? So, you know, you can pull up your chair really close, sit next to them, watch them work, and just talk in person for, the, you know, the length of three hours or whatever time it was they were drawing. So you get like a three-hour session. You could just sit there and chat with someone, and they were there to talk to people. They're there to to chat and learn. You know, you're there to learn from them, and they're there to um, show off what they do. <clears throat> um, and so these rooms, I gotta check the chat real quick. Um, if anyone has any questions, ask me. But um, I just have to make sure I check the chat, and so I don't leave anything out. If anyone has a question, uh, okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, like I said, feel free to ask me questions. I'm gonna go over some of the technical things that I learned, and y'all might know them already. That's the big thing: is that I don't do these techniques, and if you already know them, then good for you. But I learned them, and uh, there's some. I have I had workarounds to doing the same kind of stuff, but uh, I hadn't just like thought to do certain things, and also. Um, Actually, um, I, I was going to talk about the feedback the instructors gave me over my own work. And I normally do paint overs and critiques with other people. But I kind of wanted to throw up some of my images and uh, talk about the feedback Dave Raposa gave me, um, the Kapinskis, um, Marko Dershevik, and Koro Kaufman, Justin Koro Kaufman. Um, and I can go through that and show y'all the pieces I showed them and what they told me to do. And it, it was a big help. It's uh, It kind of refocused me on my illustration and what I was doing. Because for a while, I started branching out, doing a little too much, like going a little omnidirectional versus focusing on illustration and branching out from there. So now I'm definitely going to be sticking in with my illustration and branching out. Uh, so let's get back into it. Um, in these rooms, it was a screen and the instructor and then uh, chairs right and the difference between these rooms and and the main room is that the instructor is facing you and he's got the screen behind him which is it's it's much very much like a classroom and that's the same for all the rooms I'm not gonna draw them in on everything but um that's pretty much the same thing for all the rooms and uh, the big part about these rooms the main room the demo room was that the instructors are facing the artwork which means you when you first get there all you see is the 
the dude or whoever it is um, up there facing away from you on a Cintiq working. And so the initial response, I guess, for, for me and for most people, I feel like was just like, don't go bother them, you know, because they're like not even looking at you. And then when you talk with them, they have to stop and turn around and talk to you. Um, but that's why lots of this whole, uh, that's why the chairs got moved. The chairs got moved and they became really up close and personal with the uh, instructors. And it got to a, a, a vibe where they were sitting and working and you could just kind of sit next to them and say, hey, so like, what do you, th what's going through your head while you do this piece? Or like, how'd you do that so fast? And they'll go through and they'll stop the work and do a demonstration for you. So like if I'm sitting here sketching and someone's like, wow, how'd you get that opacity change? They'd go, oh, well, if you go over to your brush settings and click transfer mode, it by default goes to pin pressure. You know, like they sit there and give you a small tutorial, which is like, you're basically there for three hours with an instructor that's just a professional working in the industry who will stop whenever you request, you know, be polite about it. You know, you everyone's just like, um, so how did you do this? And excuse me, um, could you go back and show me that again? And they'll take the time to sit there and go over it again with you in person. And they'll go slow, like repeat things if you don't do it right. And then the people in the audience who are drawing on their computers or their tablets, some instructors would go, like they just be, the other instructors that weren't giving demos or sessions were walking about because they're fans of the other instructor's work, right? All these instructors are basically you and the same place with years and experience on top of you, right? So they're, they're just other illustrators, so they're just other concept artists in this place. And the difference being is that uh, they've got the years of experience under their belt, and they've got the work effort they put down that's already laid out. Um, but they're still just people. They're still just illustrators that were asked to do this. So if you imagine what it would be like if, you know, you're working nonstop, you're working here at your house, or you're working at your studio, and, you know, you're doing your work, because basically you're doing your job. That's really it. And people enjoy what you do, and one day you're asked to come and present at one of these workshops. Yeah, it's just as, if it's their first time, it's just as overwhelming for them to meet everyone that they look up to and that they admire as it is for you, um, right? And so, uh, like Ma Mateus, ah, oh crap, I'm really bad with pronouncing the names, uh, even though I was just at an event where people were t talking about all how to pronounce the names and everything. Um, let's see here. Uh, what's his name? Mateus. Mateus. Uh, where is it? Um, he's an environment artist. God damn it. I just can't think of the name right now. That's not him. Environment. Okay. Mateus Verhasselt. Verhasselt. Um, anyway. Uh, some guy working in the audience on an environment piece here. He was sitting here working on an environment piece on his uh, Cintiq hybrid. Or no, it was a ThinkPad. <coughs> Mateus was just milling about the crowd and saw him. And, uh, you know, he got to talking and just said, uh, Oh, you know, um, how exactly do you use the mixer brush on your environments? And the mixer brush is just a really nice technique that you can use to kind of lay out swatches of mixed colors and kind of like a photo texture depending on what you depending on what you get it's kind of like the clone stamp tool but it's just colors um, anyway so Matias sat down next to the dude and was just like dude you should totally try that mixer brush on this thing you're working on and he just sat there and gave him like a one-on-one -on -one. here's how you do it here's how you set it up make sure these are the settings and that guy was just sitting there, like, busting out this awesome-looking robot. And then I think there was someone else that sat next to him and was telling him, like, oh, wow, you know, I like the look of what you're doing there. And he was basically trying out the techniques he saw live in, you know, just here in the audience. And then, you know, the instructor comes by and just says, oh, I like what you're doing. Have you tried this thing? And then, you know, he instantly was able to learn something new and have the instructor just look over him 
and help them out, right? Um, so anyway, it was just cool because I was like right next to him and I saw the whole thing happen. It just seems like I mean, it's such a little thing though. It's such a tiny, like if I were walking by like a kid in high school who's just starting Photoshop and I saw him struggling with something, it's just like me sitting down and saying, hey man, you should try using this brush or you should try using this setting and then walking off because it's just like a obvious nice thing to do if you know a little more than somebody and they're struggling with something or they're just trying something out and you can you know there's a faster method you can just sit there and say hey try this out this is what I do and uh, you know it's just uh, you know being a kind person but anyway lots of that was going on um, and then in these rooms you had the one-on-one -on -one sessions and this is very much I mean this is the one-on-one -on -one sessions here with it was like the one instructor and there's like about 40 seats and some people depending on the event some people some are more popular than others so some people would just be like all standing up over here some people would be sitting down right here um, but basically this was the kind of demo class kind of environment <clears throat> it was much easier to just sit and talk with them and they you know they're right in front of you looking at you and it's you know it's like any other classroom right and then the traditional was the most classroom like where we had the instructor who was here doing his painting with the model here and another instructor might be here doing something and then there's another guy who's just painting his own thing here and this guy here too these are other instructors just working on paintings just out in the open just sitting there and uh, there was someone else here doing a and there's another model here so this was even more open because this was the most because I went to a studio uh, studio art classes at University of Texas and this was the most familiar for me to come in and see like, the little drawing horses and the easels everywhere and people just kind of open chatting with the instructors in person uh, and uh, you know so that, that was about as straightforward as you could get as far as an art class goes <coughs> excuse me and this area was a particular area where um, they did some of the larger um, events. They did a Pictionary game between Wes Burt, Marco Dojovic, Kim Jung Ji, and well, my mind's drawing a blank. But um, <laughs> my mind's drawing a blank, and it's like a some big name. So I'm like, uh, can't think of his name. Jason Chan. I think it was Jason Chan. I think it was Jason Chan. It might not have been. Um, but, uh, you know, that was... Let me look it up real quick. And I just want to look it up so you all know. Okay, you can understand what I was talking about. Um, yeah. Ian McKee. I suppose. West Burt, Marco Dojovic, Kim Jung Ji, Ian McGee. Um, they were all doing a Pictionary game right there at one point. And then the other day, Kim Jung Ji was doing his live drawing demonstration where he just sits there with the ink brush or a pen and just draws stuff straight from his head in perfect perspective and like and then when that happened, every like this whole area became like just crowded with people. And uh, it was the vibe I got was, you know, if you're against Kim Jung Ji with your class, people are probably going to go see Kim Jung Ji. But then, the cool thing about having Kim Jung Ji there is that all the instructors were huge fans of him, so there was like this equal admiration between the instructors and the attendees of this man and what he can do. You know, he's about uh, he's probably like I don't know how old he was actually. But uh, he's older than most of the instructors there, and uh, he's clearly been doing things for a while. Um, but uh, anyway, so that's kind of how it was. It was very much uh, a loose setup. It was very informal. Um, and I keep saying informal because I, um, I come from like a studio art classes and the university setting. And it was 
so much not that, but just in a way it was still the exact same scenario. Um, the biggest difference between this workshop and my studio classes is that the attendees are actively fans of the work the instructors are doing and they look up to them as you know like as a goal setting mark like one day I want to be like Westbert or one day I want to be like insert popular name here you know um, and I think in, in lots of art classes uh, it's a hit or miss. Certain art schools have instructors that are big names in their industry or big names in the art world. Like if you're going to a fine art school, you'll uh, certain universities have big, uh, extremely popular fine artists teaching classes there. And uh, some, I mean, most don't though. Most you meet these people that are technically proficient in what they do but they're not the most uh, successful artists and you just might not know their work you're learning about them and their work while they're teaching and the biggest difference I remember from my time at university was that most of our graduate instructors and our professors um, had this disconnect with the students and that main disconnect was that a certain time in the semester if the student hadn't already done this and this is also the student's fault <clears throat> right because you're supposed to like look up stuff a certain time out of the semester the instructor or the graduate student would have a day where they say I want to show you my work and they discuss their process and their work and why they're focusing on the certain subject matter and for many of the students you didn't realize that the instructor did this kind of work or that that was their their main basically their main goal and their main focus in life was this work and until you realize what they're doing it's hard to receive the instruction from them right you know because you, you don't you just know them as uh, like people that they must know what they're doing right but here at the workshop everyone knows a lot these guys right <coughs> everyone is a fan excuse me hold on <coughs> excuse me okay I'm just clearing my throat a lot today. Um, I got to make up for all the time I just didn't clear my throat the last month or two. Okay, so you're a fan of their work, right? And then you go, and they're there to instruct you. So if you make believe like this is any other conference, right? Pretend this is any other like business conference for like uh, business management. Lots of times you don't know the name of the presenter and you don't know who they are. And the only way you found out about them was because of the brochure that said we'll be a, there'll be a talk by Marty Smith, who was the author of Five Fun Ways to Run Your Business. And he was a leading Fortune 500 company guy. And you don't know these people because it's not the kind of industry that lends itself to promotion, right? But in the fine art in the fine art in the art world and this uh, like entertainment art world part of part of the end goal is to get eyes on the work like the people that work here that would do freelance and that work in these games they're hired to make artwork that will be seen that the whole purpose of the artwork is to promote something and to show off something and so their names and their work is very prominent out in the world and then when you hear about them, they're doing one of these workshops, everyone who's interested in this industry already knows who they are. And you go there thinking, oh my god, I love his work. I can't believe I get to meet this person, right? And this didn't just happen with the instructors, because several of the attendees were guys who have amazing work that I, I follow on Facebook, and uh, like CG Hub, and... Um, on the Crimson Daggers when they do their live streams and to meet them in person and see how I, in their eyes they're still trying to make it um, but for 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 me to them they're like a step ahead of me I feel like and lots of that's mainly due to the years they've been working but um, some of the other people that were there that I got to meet and just hang out with almost on the regular basis were uh, 
um, James Zapata, uh, Robert Chu. Um, mm, my mind's going a blank because there was too many of these people that were um, that were just attending. Dan Warren was there, um, you know, just as an attendee going through and meeting people. Um, Houston Sharp was there. I am friends with him on Facebook, and I follow his work. And he's just a student going to the art center right now, but like because I I know of him and I follow the stuff he's done, it's just exciting to just meet him. You know, just as like, hey, I know you, and just I know your work. And I talk with you. You know, um, Michael, what's his name? I'm looking at business cards right now. Michael Berube, 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 Michael Berube. I'm friends with him on Facebook. And anyway, um, and then some people that are really doing lots of work, and they have a notoriety that you weren't quite sure. I mean, you meet them for the first time, and then you kind of get introduced to their work. But uh, Dan DeSalt, um, I didn't seen his work, or I might have seen his work, but I didn't realize, you know, I hadn't heard of him until the workshop. Uh, but he's done a shirt for Kotaku and uh, some other... Like I'm, I don't go to Kotaku that much. It's one of the reasons I didn't know of that. Um, but that's just some of the, like a few of the names that I, of people that I kind of knew and met, and then once I really met them, um, it was just nice to know that they were just all there attending as other people there, you know. And uh, anyway, oh, um, Chase Stone, Chase Stone's got some awesome work. Yes, Chase Stone was there, James Zapata. I, I say those two in particular because I'm a fan of Chase uh, of Chase and James. James is a fan of Chase's work, and it kind of works that way where you, you're you a fan of their work, and then you meet them, and they're just kind of like, oh, man, well, you know, cool. Or <laughs> they might feel embarrassed that there's anyone there. I actually had a few people that met me. I, I want to say four. There was four people that knew these live streams that I'm doing. And um, that was strange for me because I didn't think anyone would know who the hell I was. But because of these live streams, people, uh, a few of them recognized my logo and they recognized like, oh yeah, you do those live streams sometimes. You do the paint overs. Um, let me see, where did my, did I close it? My other, my other window left. Here. There we go, my logo. So... <laughs> Um, having my logo kind of recognized it all in any fashion was cool and uh, you know for like the four people that I met there that recognized that I'm so glad that you watch these because it's, it's made a huge impact on me um, for the past month or so I haven't been doing these uh, it's partially because I've been busy shooting the vampires uh, teaser and I've been so focused on that that I, I kind of dropped out of doing my studies and my live streaming but the moment you meet someone that says, no, I used to watch those, I know those, I've seen your video online or something, it makes a huge difference. It makes like a massively, I keep saying massive now, I think that's because everyone kept saying massive black, right? But it makes like a, a great impact on you. And it's just, it's really hard to describe like, oh, like I have to keep doing these videos now because I know that people have seen them and that they've helped get me some kind of notoriety and at least I get the logo recognition right so like the, the fact that anyone even recognizes my logo is huge because one of the goals when I first created my logo was that sometime in the future when I have more of a notoriety I want to be able to not have any text with my logo and just have the symbol be my logo for artwork like so instead of having a signature on my artwork all you see is that logo and uh, that was my goal when I first made it and I knew that I was going to have to keep using that logo for a while before anything like that happened but knowing that people have actively seen my stuff it's created like this necessary um, it's just this drive now to continue doing these videos and uh, really I'm going to start going back into doing the uh, the Loomis studies. I kept. I was doing those for a while. I don't know if any of y'all watched those, but I was doing the anatomy book 
on live stream and like kind of like I am now I was talking myself through the exercise and basically I was inviting people to follow along and do the book exercises with me and I did a few of them and then I just stopped um, because they take a while like they take a few hours so but uh, the way I see it if I'm gonna do the studies anyway I'm gonna live stream them and it's only gonna benefit everyone so I'm gonna get back into doing those so I just want everyone to you know if you like anything you're hearing now about this information I'm giving out I will be doing um, the Loomis books and some other um, exercises in composition and um, more uh, like atelier style practices I can do some cast drawings and I'm gonna set up I might even set up a web camera and do that traditional like a traditional cast drawing um, and I'll do that live over live stream so you can actually see it from my camera like the what I'm doing with the graphite but you know I gotta keep doing this stuff now for myself but also for everyone that watches you know <clears throat> y'all can learn as well as myself you know and um it'll help out everyone and it'll give me some exposure but more importantly you can understand that like if you're doing your own live streams or if you're doing your own videos, it makes a difference and it, and it helps. It really does. It helps just get your name out there. Um, so like four people for me was big because I went in thinking no one was going to know who the hell I was. <laughs> so anyway, let me turn off this thing because it's not working. Um, let me get back over to the... I'm going to get back over to the... Uh, okay, to this thing and discuss a little more. Now, I'll, let me go into, I'm gonna go into what I learned technical-wise, like the like Photoshop tricks and whatnot. And I'll show you kind of a technique I used to use, and then I'll show you a better technique that I learned. And you may or may not know these techniques, but I am literally gonna be doing these for the first time right now. So if I mess up, bear with me. But uh, let's go and we just take a look at the chat. Hey, X Day Eleven. He went. He or she went to the workshop too. Had a great experience meeting artists online and getting reviews from the favorite artists. What's your name, X Day Eleven? Like your your God given name. Did I meet you? And if we didn't meet, I'm sorry because we were so close to meeting in person and we just didn't meet. So God damn it, whatever. Well, next one, right? Um, yeah, just throw in your. Just tell me who you are and show me your work. <coughs> James Wu. Did we meet? Throw your work in, uh, like a link to your work into the chat. And uh, if none of y'all know who James Wu is, y'all should check his work out. And I'm gonna check it out as soon as I'm done with the chat. Um, but uh, yeah. Um, I don't know if I'm. I've got like tons of people, and I'm not sure. I don't think I have your business card, but um, we should we should keep in touch, James Wu, because we were there. We were there. <laughs> we knew what happened those days. Um, cool, sweet man. I'm gonna look up your work, and uh, you know, all y'all do the same. In fact, if any of y'all are on the live stream right now and you have work online somewhere whether it's CG Hub or Blogspot go ahead and put the link up right now and uh, I want y'all to kind of get used to this like this is the time where you put the link up in my chat so you can look at the other one everyone else's work unless you already know everyone else I probably don't know your work so throw your work into the uh, chat so I can see who you are and later at another future workshop when I meet you I'll be able to say like James Wu dude I love your work um, but, um, I'm not sure if we shook hands or not, or if we talked. It would be a sad thing if we didn't, because <laughs> you're on here right now, and we're chatting over the internet, <laughs> and we were so close to saying hi to each other. I feel silly. All right, um, anyway. Um, yeah, so if you're watching the chat, there's eight viewers here, so I know some other people are listening to this. Throw in your link to your work, 
don't be afraid uh, we got to follow your work we have to follow each other's work because uh, I want to see who you are and how you're developing so and I want to see and I want you all to see how I'm developing and I'm gonna keep everyone updated and be really uh, really active online anyway let's get back into it if y'all have any questions feel free to ask in the chat I don't have two screens and I say this about every time I do a live stream I don't have two screens right now so I can't see the chat while I'm doing work so if I take a while to respond to you it's because I just don't see the chat um, James Wu he was a pretty quiet person in the workshop though was kind of shy meeting people okay well don't be shy James Wu um, we'll be chatting online we'll keep in touch online anyway so I guess no one else is listening to this and putting in the link whatever uh, let me get into what I've learned okay I'm gonna pull up uh, let, me, let me erase this uh, I want to erase it all just uh, uh, let me X X okay that's the first thing I learned so this is something that y'all can't see me but whenever I whenever I work I use the eraser <coughs> excuse me I use the eraser tool on the like when I'm doing these sketches if I'm drawing here I flip my pen over and I use the eraser tool and I think lots of people do that but I'm gonna start uh, at least when I'm doing my sketches I think I want to start using a different method and that different method is assigning a hotkey to the X key and the X key allows you to switch back and forth between the foreground and the background now I knew you could do that but what I didn't realize is how much faster you are when you don't have to flip your pin around and just flipping your pin around alone it takes away from like it just takes time it takes a little bit of time that you don't need to be spending it's so like I could be drawing here and using the same brush if I want to erase with the same exact brush I just press the X key and I could come in with the same brush and like carve out shapes faster you know and in the end what it leaves you with is a you know what it leaves you with is a black and white instead of uh, instead of black with nothing so at the very end you just go and do select uh, color range click your white and if you've ever used color range before make sure that you turn off your underlying layers and that's something that's not new to me but if you've never used color range before color range picks the colors on the screen whether or not they're on that layer right so anyway just use X to flip back and forth while you're sketching and then uh, when it comes to like really I think really doing the paintings if you're working on like a single layer <coughs> excuse me and using like a foreground color and a background color it's easier to just sit here and blend between two different colors rather than erase and this really turns your digital painting into a digital painting versus a digital drawing you know like digital drawing would be like let me uh, do a clear this thing okay So digital drawing would be like I'm sketching on a new layer here, and the layer I'm on is invisible, right? And then if you look at my layers here, I have a white layer and an invisible layer. So I'm sketching on this invisible layer, something, some dude or whatever, I don't know. I'm just doing shapes. And then I go, oh, I made a mistake. I'm going to just kind of tighten it up by erasing it. Or, or I, come to an er I come to a time when I'm finishing my sketch up, and I'm like, oh, I'm about to do this awesome bird thing who's shooting a fireball. And then I want to go in and tighten up my sketch. I might come in here and like start erasing and cleaning up some of the areas and redrawing. And this is like digital drawing, right? This is like sitting in your, your sketchbook and just working out ideas. And as you work out ideas, you um, you may or may not refine an idea in the sketchbook by going in and just like, uh, didn't want to do that. Just kind of erase it. Just kind of do this. But when you're painting, let me 
get a better brush. When you're painting, like if you actually had a canvas here and you're sitting here painting, the biggest difference when you're painting on canvas is that there's no eraser. So like if I go, oops, I didn't mean to do that. You can't take your paint eraser and take the paint off the canvas. You can take like a rag and wipe it off. But you're probably just going to take a, a, a different, like your, your background color and start painting over it. And that's what most traditional painters do. If you're tightening a shape up, if I want to refine this shape here, oops, if I want to refine this shape here that I'm working on, I want to work on the edges. I'll flip between my, I'll flip between my colors, and I'll start carving in with the background color. And then, after I'm carving in with the background color, I'll put the foreground color and say, okay, now I want to, I want to load my brush with this new color here, and I'll work right here. But then I still want that black, so I'll have black and gray. Now I'm working between black and gray here. Cause that's how painters work, right? <coughs> and like I said, this might be this is like the most some of the most basic stuff that I'm picking up and I'm gonna have to start using because it just makes things a lot faster, you know. Okay, let me. Um, I'm gonna pull up an image I'm, I've been working on so I can kind of give y'all more of a more of an idea of. How this works. Here we go. So this is a work in progress. I just haven't finished it all. Um, I actually should recompose this whole thing. This just started off as a sketch. That's the reason it's kind of here and there. But um, so there's a group here. Let me see if this was right. Okay. So the way the way I started off this this drawing, like this guy here is uh, I have a gray background, I turn on a new layer, I pick the same gray color, and then I turn on I turn it to multiply, and I start drawing with a multiply layer, my drawing, right? And I sit here and I draw my drawing with a multiply layer, right? Well, on a multiply layer, and I, see this is just this old technique I've used, and I, for me it was just an easy way to like, to get a drawing down, right? The issue is when it comes time to paint, I have to do some work with my layers. And when normally what I do is I have to turn this layer to a normal layer and begin painting in normal mode, right? So here's another issue with this me working on a multiply layer, which is what I used to do. I have to flip my pencil to erase because on a multiply layer, everything that goes down onto the layer is then overlaid uh, let me use a different word it's then it transfers down to the layer beneath and it darkens it so I can't sit here and take the original color because I'm actually using the original color so I sit here and I flip my pencil back and forth and it's very much like a drawing method of working like a sketchy method and what I need to do now in my old process, I would have to say, okay, I want to start drawing this thing. I want to start painting him. So let me just like, let me just kind of do something a little more like he's a weird dude thing. Whatever, he's got like legs and stuff. So you get the idea. I get to a point where I'm like, okay, I need to start painting this guy. He's a... Uh, I'm almost there. I gotta start doing the, the painting work. The issue is that I'm already on the multiply layer and I can't just start painting onto this layer because anything I paint, like if I select a lighter color, it's just gonna go dark because I'm already on that color anyway. So this is what I would do. This is my technique. I would color pick the darkest gray here and then I would turn this to a normal layer he disappears because he's the same color as the background. 
Then I go to color overlay. It makes him red. I pick the color that's already in my little swatch here, which is that darker gray. So now look, he looks exactly the way he used to do, right? But now, if I were to sit here and if I wanted to use black, it won't look black because I've used a color overlay layer. It's just a flawed method I was using. Yeah, I mean, most people don't do this, right? But if you've watched me on live stream, you've seen me do this stuff before. Like, this is how I work when I start off. I'm not going to do this anymore because it doesn't make as much sense. Now what I need to do to continue my old method is I create a blank layer. I take my top layer, hold shift, click the blank layer, command E to merge, and now it is a normal layer with that same gray and if I color black on it it's actually black it's just like see how many steps that took to get from point A to point B it's just a long time and you know I don't oops it's just not a good method and it's just partially it's my own fault because that's just what I was doing I was just comfortable doing that so Now, one of the tools I saw um, was Dave, Dave Raposo was using this, and Dave doesn't normally talk about his uh, Photoshop, like the technical things. He normally focuses on fundamentals when he goes and does his talks, but on the live demonstrations at the workshop, he spoke a lot about some of the Photoshop techniques he gets, he uses in order to help him paint. So let's start this image again. Um, I'm going to just turn this guy off. And I'm going to take pure black, press X. I'm going to take the color right here, this gray. So I'm working between black, I press X, and the same gray. So I'm going to be erasing and drawing with the same. Ah, crap. I see, I'm not used to it yet. <coughs> Okay, so now I'm only going to be pressing X and I have the brush tool here. So let me do a quick drawing. I've got like a face I'm going to draw or something. And you sit here and you're working and then you're like, okay, I'm drawing this face. Press X. I'm going to clean up some of this stuff that I didn't mean to keep on here. Press X switch back over drawing 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 and now if you've seen my live stream critiques before you know that the number one thing I always talk about is that people dip to black way too often like like right now all I'm using is pure black and gray right so I sit here and I draw. And just bear with me real quick so I can kind of get you something to see while I do this. <coughs> um. Um. <laughs> Sorry, I'm <li> <laughs> I'm not so good talking and painting. Um, anyway, so I've got this head thing, whatever, right? It's just like this guy. Well, now I'm about to I'm about to render him, um, <coughs> but I've got lots of pure black in the into it, you know, in his features, and you don't want pure black, like. See how, like, uh, let me get the arrow tool. Or uh, actually, I'll just draw an arrow. This is pure black right here. And all this is pure black. And if I color pick it, you can see that it's like, it's almost pure black at that point. It's pure black on the eye. So, having pure black all over the place isn't good. You should only have it at your key 
focal points and you know you should just avoid using it when you have to but if you're sketching like me you normally pick black as a as a color to sketch with like you just pick black and start drawing the same way like you don't pick a colored pencil to sketch with some people I mean you do the, the blue pencil stuff but like so now now what we have to do is figure out a way to take out all the black <coughs> um, all the black that uh, is here and basically turn it up now there's multiple ways to do this you can pardon me I'm just answering a text message you can uh, first use the levels or the uh, curves um, sorry just bear with me okay so you can first use the levels or curves with me one more last time we're just finishing this text message okay so if I want to remove the black and actually let me let me go ahead and put in some white just to sh like have some kind of like three levels at least so let's just say here and I'm gonna blend I'm pressing X now I'm using this new method X. Oops. You could just paint it in. First, okay, the first option is just paint away the black. So, like, if this is really black, I'll just take the gray on and just lightly go over it. And that's just the first method, right? That's like the number one thing to do is just to put another color on it because that's what you would do traditionally. But because we're digital, we could take the levels, we find the blacks, and I'm sorry, find the grays and boost it. And it turns all of our blacks to a gray. And I've done this in the past. I'm on the wrong layer, sorry. I've done this in the past. Now if you if I color pick, I'm now at a 90% black. The darkest looks like it's right here. That's it. Uh, no, actually, that's still that's a little lighter, so it's like 80%, right? So that was one way to fix it. We, we pulled it out with the levels, pulled the black out, okay? And then we can, like, adjust to, like, We still want it to look a little darker. We can kind of adjust. But right now, there is no pure black in here. And now I can go in with my pure black color. Um, I'm on the wrong layer again. Crap, hold on. That was the mask layer. Okay. Now I can go in with my pure black color and say, I want the eye to be the focal point and I could put in pure black right here in the eye and like right here in this crevice, 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 just because it makes sense to be there. And uh, you know, that's like what you do. You go in and find the focal points and you put the extremes right near the focal points. That way it'll help you, help you draw the eye. So, that was method number one, <clears throat> which is what I would have done in the past, and uh, just flatten that. And method number two, you know, you can do the same thing with curves. So that's almost. I'm not going to go over that one. Um, is uh, I would also use the uh, color overlay. The color overlay. It overlays a color over all the, you know pixels but I could say I only want it to multiply or I'm sorry it's opposite screen and then I could turn down the opacity so I could screen with the original gray I had 
and now so I've adjusted globally the blacks because the black on uh, this gray on a screen layer is going to turn down my blacks naturally, right? And then I have to do the same thing before as you go to a new layer, hold shift, merge it, and now it's a lighter colored layer. And I can go back in with my blacks here and say, okay, I want this to be the focal point. And I come in and do that again, you know. So. Those are two different methods, right? <coughs> Excuse me. And the method I learned that I think I want to try and work with now is just using selective color, which uh, let me see if it's even here. I've never used before. Like I've never even like here selective color. So now the selective color it's basically another way to isolate colors but this is the most efficient way that I've learned at the workshop and you can you can do it as a color uh, you can do it as an adjustment layer or you can do it as a um, image adjustment but I could try and find let's say let's say there's a let me actually put it in here let me say there's this red right here and I wanted to make that red blue. If you if you already know how to do this, just bear with me while I get through this part. But for me, this is new. You know, you just say reds, and uh, you can basically you're selecting all the reds in the in the picture, and you're adjusting it. So like. I've selected the reds and it's only adjusting the red. And basically these sliders, I'm taking the black out of the red, it makes it almost white. But if I put the black into the red, it makes it a really dark red. Like, like it makes the red, um, it doesn't make it dark, but what it does is it, it kind of keeps the saturation. And like here, on the, if you look, notice the gradient, uh, when I take out the yellow, 100% it makes it more of a magenta you know and so let me uh, let me make this now I can select the uh, neutrals so neutrals of course are all the grays and I can start adding in cyan so like I have gray right now but let's say I want I want it to be really blue so there's cyan and here I'm gonna add some magenta so now of course it's gonna look kind of purplish bluish uh, I'll add some yellow, blue, you know, that makes it green. And if you notice, it's not affecting my black and it's not affecting my white. It's really only affecting the gray. And one of the one of the other ways I used to, if I wanted to just affect a certain color, I always used to use color range. But color range, you have to isolate the color like if I do color range and I want to isolate the gray, um, it immediately you gotta you have to kind of play around with it because if you noticed, if I make if I boost the fuzziness, it bleeds into my darker gray, but if I if I make it harder, you have some of my lighter gray that's being cut out from the main gray of the background. So I could boost my fuzziness up, but I ended up losing some of the information from my other colors. So it's not like a straight shot um, adjustment, right? I can make it super fuzzy, and it basically um, you can't see until you zoom in how it it kind of blending the pixel it blends the pixels in a way I don't like. Um, but anyway, with the selective color instantaneously isolates the color and one like all I have to do is say neutrals and all the neutrals are affected globally um, let me un let me see I think this is default yeah so this is back up my default color now I'm going to go to blacks because we don't want the black black color in here so all we have to do is select black and let's say this whole image is gonna have a cool tone to it so I'm going to add in some cyan to
to my black. I'm going to add in some magenta. Got this magenta and cyan, and I'm going to come down to blacks, and I can take out my black from from the black. Which, if you notice here, it turns it, it goes at one point. It goes like uh, so neutral. It's almost it's almost the same gray. And then we go all the way to white, or we could go and make it super black. Like we we'll just it takes kind of the the transparent black and it'll boost it to like 100% black pretty much or um, it's close to 100% um, so I'm just gonna starting it starting at like zero which is right here I'm just gonna take it down a few notches right and if I flatten this layer now if it's an adjustment layer I flatten it or I could just you know kind of preserve the uh, sketch turn on a new layer but now if we color pick the blue here that's in the middle of the eye uh, you'll notice it's at 90 percent and I can still go back in with my black and I still have an extra tier of value I can use now right um, so that's the it's one of the methods there you know it gives you this extra it's a way to go back in and uh, kind of create this extra what am I saying it allows you to go back in there and kind of create a new tier of value by globally selecting your black and like I said there's other methods like if you do the levels method it works just as well just adjust the levels and knock the black out or adjust the curves or you can do selective color select the blacks and then um, boost it that way or something you know and the very the very easiest method though is just to like take up take your lighter value and just paint it in that's like the, but if you have the whole painted painting sketched out you're not going to go over every single inch of the painting to just boost down a color when you have the tool right next to you so selective color is the, basically the tool that I want to show everyone selective color um, gives that global coloring that'll just help you unify your picture early on rather than later and something I've done before is like I uh, I wait till the end to unify which I still will do but now earlier on I can kinda get a grasp into like the colors I want to be using uh, I'm checking the chat real quick so hi everyone I like what you're doing guys but I'm feeling bad about linking my blog because I'm drawing on paper and I think we're digital painting available with color um, James, your art's really nice. So like, okay, hello. Okay, so anyway, Ash, as hash. Don't feel bad about linking in my chat um, because I want to see your work. But uh, anyway, back to something else I learned. So, selective color is the big, the big tool that I want to start using. And actually, let me. I'm gonna actually set up my Wacom tablet real quick. And I want to do that in front of y'all so you can understand what I'm doing. Uh, and selective color, I, I learned that from Dave's uh, Dave's talk, Dave Raposa. Um, and you know, I think I think most people that have seen the stream, like myself, when I watch the old streams he's done, he rarely talks about the Photoshop techniques he uses. He might he's talked about like a soft light or overlay layer, but um, he rarely goes into using these, like talking about these other techniques. And it's just, you know, something to, it's just another tool to use, really. Because, like I said, there's four other ways to do what I just did. Uh, but I like the selective color method because it's kind of a direct, it's a direct application, right? So, I need to assign a keystroke. I don't use the touch on my computer, on my Wacom. So, I'm turning my touch setting. I'm setting it to X and the name will be um, foreground slash background there we go so now I have X attached to my hotkey so now so now I can go in and if I select gray I press foreground background 
select blue, press foreground background, and I can just, I don't even have to press the X key, I could just start drawing. And if I want to come in with another color, <coughs> it's already just linked to my Wacom tablet. Um, and this is, this is another, this is something that Marco uh, Derjevic was using on his uh, sketching too. He has his key, or he has his hotkey set to X while he sketches. So he's just constantly drawing, 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 press X, flips it, carves out shapes. And he has a more line art approach. He has a much more line art approach, like straight up just line art. But um, it's a similar technique. So, you know. So there, that's my color. It's my new hotkey set up on my Wacom. Hold on a quick. Okay, so I've got um, I've got uh, another technique I'm going to use. What I am going to do um, really quickly is I'm going to have to be right back. And if you have any questions about the workshop, let me know. I just I don't want to um, I don't want to answer questions about anything that's not kind of a technique thing or like. A personal question about something that I learned um, like if you're asking questions about the artists themselves uh, I feel awkward talking about them basically behind their back online in front of everyone <laughs> so um, but anyway it's gonna go X day 11 James James I need to look up his stuff I need to look up DeviantArt Ash, ash, okay. Anyway, I just had to save your um, the links before y'all left, but James already left. Okay. What's my YouTube channel? My YouTube channel, um, I think it's MC I I I. I think that's it. Might not be. Oh, there's only three eyes. If you look up Miguel Coronado I I I on Google and like look for my YouTube channel, you should find me. Um, but also Mike 086 Mike 086 is a uh, my username on everything so anyway um, yeah if, if you have to cut out while I'm doing this um, let me know I mean don't let me know but just do it and I'll, I'll put the video up later um, and it'll have a more clean it'll look nicer than like me going back and forth and coughing all the time but uh if you have any questions, let me know before you go, because that's the big thing that I'll need to uh, I'll need to be able to address. Uh oh, my live stream just went dark. I don't know what happened. Can y'all see me? Okay, there you go. Okay, I'm gonna go back into it now. Let's go over some things. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I don't know why I'm clearing my throat so much. <clears throat> I talked non-stop while I was there, and I feel like I didn't have to clear my throat once, but now I'm clearing my throat all the time. Um, okay, so let's minimize this. Uh, let's get this back on. I'm back already. So I went over the Selective Color Tool, which uh, is a awesome technique I'm going to be using. I also went over using the X key instead of the eraser on the Wacom pen. I even set up my X key to my uh, Wacom tablet, so it's one of my new defaults. Um, it's right here. It's called foreground, background color. Uh, my other default is this one, flip. I don't know if anyone knows about this, but if you set your canvas flip to a Wacom key, you can just flip your canvas really quickly. That's just a FYI. Um, Anyway, I just wanted to make sure everyone knew about that. Uh, 
Uh, okay, so now we're going to go over the mixer brush. And I may or may not mess up while I'm doing this. Right? So I got to just make sure I understand how to work with this. So the, you go to the brush tool. And it, I believe mixer brush is in CS5 as well as CS6. We'll go to mixer brush here. You want to set to dry heavy load. And um, you have to hold Alt. And when you hold Alt, you select. Uh, oh, let me flatten the image. You got to be on the layer you want. So, like, I'm going to have Mixer Brush. It's set to dry heavy load. You hold Alt. Click where you want to sample from. And if you've noticed up here, it's really small. You actually see the eye of this dude because I just sampled from the eye. So now when I paint with my brush, you should see, yeah, you see like this eye stamp. You see how I'm stamping out the eyeball? And actually, uh, shit, there's the eyeball. <laughs> Didn't mean shit to go that big. So you can stamp the eyeball now. But also as I make my paint strokes, the eyeball turns with my stroke and uh, it helps create like a 3D effect if you have the right setup. Uh, let me switch my brushes to something different to see how it behaves. Now here's an angled brush. So this angled brush, all the information in the eye reads is like a ribbon, right? And um, just the hard round. You see what it did there? If I just stamp it, it first, because it's set to transfer mode, it starts small and it press. Oh, starts small and I press, and it kind of like. There we go. You gotta like slowly press. And it, uh, maybe not. There we go. Whatever. So then it kind of stamps out the eyeball, or I can make like this tube like structure. And you see how the how this could work, right? So like if I do this tube-like structure, um, suddenly like I have this 3D element I can work with, and it's easier for me to come in and light this with a regular brush tool. And then I come in with a regular brush and go like, okay, um, this is all dark and it's like a dragon or whatever, and you know it's like a way to lay a, it lay, helps you lay a foundation very quickly, right? So that's the mixer brush. Um, a, a better way to use the mixer brush, and uh, you like, it depends. I mean, it's there's all kinds of ways you should experiment with it. But um, like, here's a blue circle. I'm going to take my soft round with this light color here. I'm going to basically try and make a sphere. And then I'll do like this gray as my counter lighting. Oh, they didn't select it properly. Whatever. Just sit here and. Oops. Get like a sphere going. Whatever, anyway. I got this little shape. And then uh, we'll select the mixer brush again. Hold Alt. Click in the middle. I might need to do a. I don't know how to adjust the size of my sample. Oh, you know what? I think it's the brush size. I think the brush size needs to be the sample size you want. So Alt, click. Maybe I could be zoomed out. Oops. Alt, click. Yeah, there we go. So now it's uh, because I have the circle separated in a different layer. I can take the mixer brush now 
and I can draw like this tube and because I I set up the lighting on one side and the shadow on the other you know like the, the, the reflective um, the bounce light or whatever you can see how I'm like painting and kind of like a 3d look and if I t if I press gently I can adjust the size like this further back and I press harder turn it around gives these weird tubes it just gives you a good foundation to work from so you don't have to sit there and like paint the tube the traditional way <coughs> it's a little faster for illustration it's a good starting point for concept art it's just a great fast time saver anyway Okay, so let's delete that. That's a mixer brush. It's pretty simple, right? You got to make sure that the layer you ha you're on has the colors you want. So it can't be like the eyeball can't be on a separate layer if you want to sample all this color. Um, um, and you just select your brush. You have to select dry, heavy load. And then um, you select dry heavy load, and then you're able to um, kind of just paint with the color, the sample color you did. Right now, I'm just painting on wet light mix because uh, the dry heavy load setting is the setting that Mateus was using, and this wet heavy mix it appears to be dragging pixels more. Because the dry heavy load appeared to be um, the dry heavy load appeared to be um, just adding new pixels, very wet. You can kind of see how this is working, but if you want the straight up hard edge, dry heavy load, and I have this just set to like 100% opacity. Oh, and see the spacing is off on this one so like you can see the individual spheres but it gives you an alternate look right so if you're doing like a hose like if you're doing like a, like a dude who had like these like a cyborg who had like these hoses attached and have all this ribbing you can see how that would help you right you don't have to sit there and if it's supposed to look uniform you don't have to sit there and uniformly make it you can go back in and give some grunge and like alter it a little bit so anyway um, I'm just checking for questions um, pardon me real quick that's the mixer brush and then like so say play around with the different settings like if uh, if I set the spacing further apart it would give me even more of a like repeated shapes through space it's almost just stamping the image down and then when you um, take the spacing away completely it's just a tube And uh, because you can set the because you can set the pin pressure for the size, you can start off like a small tube in the distance, and then you can make it come close to you and come back around and like go further in the distance. It's delayed right now because my computer is being taxed. Or it looks like a <laughs> or it looks like a giant condom, whatever. Anyway, it's fun to play with. I want to try it out a little bit just for some speed painting and things. But there you go. <laughs> Looks like clay or something. Okay, mixer brush. Now, let's go into another cool trick. And this one I need to kind of set up uh, a sketch. 
um, select all, delete, white, <coughs> X, sketch now, um, let's just draw like a, uh, a dude or something like, here's a, here's like a piece of clothing, this is like a shoulder, just so y'all understand what's going on here. Yeah. Here's a face. <laughs> I'm doing this quick. I just want to show you the technique. So let's say you're doing line art, and I'm sure you can. We can. We can play around with this a little bit and kind of get a better effect. Let's say you wanted to do like this guy's got like a an earring with cords like there's like a like let's say this is the earring right here and it's got tassels so you're gonna use there's different ways you could draw the tassels you can go like one and you go in really close and draw the next tassel and you could draw the next tassel and you can draw the next tassel Or you can like, you know, uh, th those are the tassels, right? The other option you could do is a uh, press. Let's see, I get the background color. Oops. Got my background color set. Have a new layer. Set my layer to stroke. That's the wrong. That's a uh, blend mode. Sorry. Set my layer to stroke, and uh, uh, let's just keep it at black. Three point. Say okay. So I'm gonna draw these tassels again, but now I need to draw like three of them. Now you, this is like a simple thing, right? Actually, I need to have like 100% white. There we go. So now I want to draw the tassels. Oops. And uh, I can draw the full tassel in one in one stroke and just be done with it. And this is for the preliminary sketch, right? The preliminary drawing. It's not for like the finished piece. Basically, you know, now it's a rope, right? Um, or like if I wanted to do like a circle. God damn it! If I want to do like a circle. I can come back here and do the circle. Whatever. And it immediately gives you a border. So you don't have to draw it twice. And it's just nice. It's just a nice quick like you know, and the and the and the and the time it's gonna take you to draw a dude, you know, kinda of the last thing you wanna do is sit there and draw every single little tassel. Or I guess if you're trying to draw a spaghetti. <laughs> you're trying to draw a spaghetti and you're just not having it <coughs> you could just use this technique and if you want to preserve those strokes um, have a new layer underneath select both layers so you select the layer that you just drew on with the stroke setting and the blank layer underneath it command command E now it's a regular normal layer so now if I draw Now if I draw on this layer, it's not going to give me a, a black stroke anymore. See how it's just normal now? Anyway. There we go. It's a little stroke technique. That's, uh, that's another one. But yeah, so that's just, these are little tricks, right? They're just little tricks. They're not like anything mind-blowing that's going to like, unless you're trying, unless you have a commission to draw a ton of spaghetti and line art mode form then you know it doesn't even look that good the stroke mode so like you'd have to refine it anyway so it's just a little technique if there's a small element that needs to be at, to have parallel lines running for you know whatever segment then uh that's a quick tip to kind of get in there and do that right 
if it wasn't uh but if that's i mean most most work isn't going to need that much i mean unless you're doing lots of heavy costuming with that kind of detail stuff it's only a ground work because you still have to go in and refine it so it saves you time in your sketch mode because you don't have to like add in a bunch of stuff later you don't have to really go back and refine a bunch of stuff later so this, this, this idiot dude right here um, anyway okay so let me just save this and close it I'm gonna start a new document I'm gonna open up a, a new document that'll lend itself to this little tutorial thing this is a uh, what is this I'm gonna pull up this Radiohead fan art thing I was doing I have never finished this um, but uh it's supposed to look like ink line art. This is the perfect um, piece for this. Uh, this this piece right here is the perfect example for this technique. But uh, <clears throat> basically, I've got this sketch. I'm trying to make it look like it's pen and ink. Uh, I had been right, and uh, I got to go back in and rework it a bit. It's Tom York from Radiohead. He's going to be exploding into a robot. But um, anyway. What you could do is... Uh, I'm, I'm going to turn off the other layers. So this is just the half of his face. If you want to give it a more ink-like feel, digitally, you could just set your layer to um, outer glow set your color to black set it to multiply and then you can adjust it basically you just wanna lower the opacity and the size a bit you could probably you need a noodle around with it the thing is is that my image wasn't properly prepped for this, but basically what you're doing is you are giving, you're using the outer glow to achieve a um, you're using the outer glow to achieve a uh, what'd you call it? Like a ink bleeding into paper feeling. you want it to look like your pen strokes gently bled into the the paper you're drawing on, right? Because that's what happens in real life. Now, right now it looks like I used a marker and uh, the marker bled into the paper too much. You know, but you can see how that I achieved that effect. It looks like a marker that I scanned now, like if I had a black marker, Sharpie or something. Just kind of, and it bled too much. Like my paper wasn't thick enough. It helps ground your image digitally with a more traditional vibe, and that's really just this. This whole little trick here is like that's solely a personal. Um, what do you call it? It's like a. It's like a little uh, a look that you may or may not want. Um, so that that element there if you don't want it if you don't care about the digital look to your image then it's almost like you wouldn't really need to worry about it but if you're trying to get a more traditional look while working digitally then using that technique will kind of ground your ink into the canvas and by grounding the ink into the canvas when you do your fine art print later you get like a high res print you know done up at a some kind of print shop you'll be able to um, people that buy the print it'll almost kind of give them like the oh did they did they just paint this straight up on the um, 
on the paper, you know? And that's something you may want and you might not want. So, like I said, it's hit or miss. Hit or miss in terms of, like, whether you're going for that look. Um, and the last thing is a clone stamp. And the clone stamp tool is uh, basically a way to kind of get ideas down and um, create something. It lays a bunch of colors down for you to work with. So if I open up a document, what I'm going to do is just like, um, what's his name? Oh man, I can't think of his name. Tom Tom Scholes does this. He does like he calls it. Re uh, he calls it the art remix, where you take old art and you remix it. You make something new out of something old or something unused. Like, um, here's this crappy thing, right? Here's this kind of crappy thing that I'm going to, uh, I'm going to use as my, my palette. So I'm getting the clone stamp tool. I'm going to hold alt and like stamp right here. And then I'm going to go to this new document. I still have the clone stamp tool activated. And I'm going to start painting with my clone stamp tool. All right. Of course, right here is the go through, select another area, go back in, paint some more, clone stamp, and it lays out stuff for you, right? The other thing is you can use the mixer brush on a previous document. mixer brush um, pick out like this area of stuff here go back to this document start painting with this <coughs> it's gonna take forever to load hold on a quick um, so Start painting with that, and then you can like go back and uh, you take the original document, you open it up, copy it, paste, and uh, I'm just going to transform it real quick. Paste set to screen, transform it, flip it, and you use your, you use an old image to help you find something new, basically, you know. We've all got these old pieces of works that, they might not be finished, but um, the shapes and then like the language and the textures can help you translate out. Now there's another person that's not me that sat down and watched Tom Scholl's talk more than I did. So they'd probably be the best one to talk about this. But just from watching him, you basically take in your image, you start overlaying these things, and then uh, you can start getting weird and interesting shapes. You can unify it here with this uh, brush. So like now, you can look back at this image and say, okay, what's going on here? You can start seeing these, uh, you can start seeing a form kind of coming out. It's for ideation, ideation, whatever, just to get some, help you get some ideas going. Color dodge, maybe I should screen, screen. some of that one and 
And the thing about these techniques is like knowing how they do it is like nothing, right? You have to have the background and the fundamentals to utilize them properly. Otherwise, you're just making a big mess on your canvas and you're like, you're not going to know how to unify it. If you don't know how to unify it, well then you're going to have, you know, it's a big problem. Let me see here. I don't know what that is. There's probably a better way. Like I said, if someone else saw that tutorial, that's not me, and knows much more about it than I do. So let's uh stamp in. So it looks like the document needs to be a certain size. You know? Like the document would need to be the same size as the other document or something. It might help. But then also using like the mixer brush set to alt pick out an area and then um, I'm gonna set this to moist light mix come back here and paint with this like that just repeating the same shapes you know I might pick out a different brush that I'm gonna flatten this whole thing, layer. Oh my god, hold on. I'm taxing my machine, so let's go back. Flatten the image. Um, and then from here, you can lasso out things, you know. And this is where you start, it starts turning into like your normal, like digital painting, or whatever. Inverse. set this to regular brush set this to screen there we go you know and then you can you start creating and you know smoke and stuff whatever whatever your heart desires but um Yeah, this is how, it's just, a, it's a starting point. Like I said, lots of these are just starting points, and lots of these are, like, completely optional things. There's nothing there that anyone picked up that is going to be, like, the thing that is going to help, like, change your career forever. Um, that kind of stuff, oh, oops, set to dissolve that kind of stuff like the thing that uh is going to change your career forever is the experience the biggest the biggest important takeaway i got from this trip was uh that i want to focus on illustration for sure i do not want to focus on concept art um i want to focus on the full illustration and from there I can branch out to possibly doing concept art later. But I want to focus on illustration and become successful at illustration before anything else. So that's the big like career changing information that I got from this. Like uh the other thing is just learning like that everyone's exactly the same. Like we're all doing the same thing, and we're all uh, we all like to help each other. We're not like the industry where um, the illustration and design industry is not the industry where people are gonna like actively go steal ideas um, as a creative because it does nothing for you. It does nothing to steal someone else's idea because it just means you don't have that you don't have any good ideas, and you're kind of proving it to yourself by going out and stealing an idea or like a technique like people learning that the mixer brush 
is a way to go about creating an environment it does nothing if you don't know anything about environments. Or like me, if you weren't really focused on just environment pieces, it doesn't do much because I'm going to be focusing on illustration. I need to have a planned composition rooted before I begin any kind of environment. So I can't just throw in, I can use a mixer brush for some textures and some like values, but I'm not going to be able to just randomly go haywire with the mixer brush and then figure out figure out what I'm going to uh, make it. Like I have to have that stuff planned out, you know. It's not going to be a situation where like now that I know this one technique, I will rule, you know. <sighs> Oops. Um. Anyway, hold on a quick. I gotta check a message. Um, anyway, like knowing that mixer brush technique does nothing. Like if you don't know anything about environments, it's not going to help you because you're still going to struggle making an environment. But um, um, but if part of what you do is like this ideation where you need to like get some ideas down fast then it's a great technique you know it creates happy accidents for you um yeah so anyway hold on no oh, I'm on the wrong layer I'm on the wrong I was on the mask <sighs> Anyway, so yeah, that's uh, that's one of the things, you know, you take away from the trip is that the tools don't really matter because every artist that's an instructor there uses the same tool. They, every, except for like Andrew Jones, everyone's using Photoshop. Everyone has the same, they know the techniques that you know, but um. But the big difference is that uh, some people just don't need those techniques, don't like them, some people do. And then uh, in the end, if it doesn't help your job, then it's just kind of pointless. And if you don't know the fundamentals, you're not going to know how to bring everything together. You know? Anyway, whatever. That's just me bullshitting around. Um, this looks stupid. <laughs> I, got, I like, the ray, like the rays of light that are coming in here. That looks cool. That was unintentional. I could exploit that now and like build in the rock textures here and like the rays of light here. Um, kind of push the rays. Anyway, so like. That's the the cool part is meeting everyone, and uh, now that I know these people, I can follow their work actively and be excited about when they progress in their career. They could be excited when I progress in my career, and then when we meet up again, we can share and talk about techniques and yeah critiques that are going to help us all out. And with that said. Um, with that said, I'm going to close this document and close this document. And I'm going to uh, restart this stream. I think that was everything. Oh, there's a photo bashing. Um, there's a photo bashing technique that it's not a technique. It's just a, a mindset to keep in, you know, to kind of keep in mind, right? So like. 
to make your photo bash stuff look a lot more together. Like if I'm going to photo bash like a like a robot dude. I got to kind of First of all, if you're doing photo bash techniques um your projects will be much more together if you are working from an established idea because I know lots of people that do photo bashing they start by just kind of throwing textures together and then they'll build off like they kind of try to get the idea down and then from there they build off the um, they build off their ideas you know but the most successful artists that use photo bashing have a powerful sketch underneath and this is not <laughs> this is not that sketch but imagine I spent like a good a good half hour to an hour just working on some line art do an idea out just kinda like okay here's this dude I'm gonna draw Here's this dude I'm gonna draw, and then like uh, I'm gonna go back in with photo bashing and throw in some textures. One of the best ideas to keep in your head while you're doing that is that if this guy is a human-sized dude, sorry, if this guy is a human-sized dude, um, that is to say, he's like no bigger than seven feet tall you know like he's at least five feet tall right when you throw in a photo texture like if I want to throw in a photo texture here of a component I can't just throw in any photo texture I can't just throw in like I can't throw in a tractor wheel because there are parts of the tractor wheel that are shaped and complex that only a tractor wheel can have. And this component is so small that some of the subtleties of the tractor wheel will be just, just too big to use. So instead of finding a tractor wheel, you would use like I gotta try and find out where I put my stuff. Instead of putting on a tractor wheel, uh, what is it? Robots machines. Here we go. I guess here we go. This is machine one. So, like this wheel here. This wheel's bigger than that guy. Like, like it's 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 about the size of his head. So like that wheel is probably about this big right so making that wheel fit to here won't look as good as me choosing this little sprocket here so if I take this little sprocket here this little thing this is about the size of that component that I drew so when I lay in my component here, and you know, you probably want to try and find something a little more um, straight on, but you know, whatever. We're gonna we're gonna to distort it and fix it anyway. We're gonna paint over everything. So like this component is about the size of that component. This real life component is about the size of that component that I just found, and thus as I continue to build my um, as I continue to build my my robot, I'm only using components that are sized in the same relation to uh, to an actual human. Now, if this was supposed to be a giant robot, like if this guy was supposed to be um, 50 feet tall, you would want to find components in the real world that are literally like 50 feet tall so you would have to go and like what would be that big 
that looks you know about that size like you'll find a tractor wheel in that case and put that tractor wheel component on the ear and it's going to be more of a believable structure attached to him than this little bitty component because this little bitty component blown up would be like solid steel but like anyway it it helps it makes a huge difference to use textures and items that are literally to scale with your image so what I mean by that is like they are because you're drawing a guy anything bigger than a dude that texture wouldn't work as well as the texture of a rusty motorcycle helmet so if I got like a rusty motorcycle helmet and put it right here it would blend and the textures would read as believable textures and if I if I was making this giant beast that's like 50 feet tall I could actually pull a texture from like the side of a truck or like a semi truck right like you know the semi truck of the big panel boxes like if there was a rusty semi truck or a rusty train I could take that texture and put the rusty train right here because the dude's 50 foot tall so the rust pattern is literally to scale with the size of my character versus the rust pattern of a spoon like a rusty spoon it would have a different texture and look because it's basically a smaller scale and uh, you know unless you're taking like a macro lens shot of it the elements of that rust only exist as a small element anyway I, I'm not sure if you guys are following what I'm doing but uh, hold on a quick Um, so anyway, so if you're if you're photo bashing a creature, make sure all the components in the photos are literally um, like to scale with the creature. So like if you're giving a robot an electronic eyeball it might be useful for you to pull camera components in because the camera component is no bigger than a human head unless it's like a giant lens or if you're photo bashing a massive mecha robot make sure you're pulling elements from like a tank or a aircraft carrier something huge that way when you're laying in these textures and these shapes they translate scale wise and it helps the audience look at your work and go, oh wow, that's just a really strongly structured image because you're considering those things. So anyway, now what I'm going to do, I'm going to stop the stream and I'm going to pull up some of my own artwork and I'm going to tell you the feedback I got for my artwork. And uh, the feedback comes from Marco Derjevic, Justin Kuro Kaufman, and Dave Raposa. And uh, also Josh Herman, who's a Marvel, a Marvel artist that works with Marvel Studios. Um, the movie, movie artist, like film, film stuff. So I'm going to show y'all what they told me about my own work and discuss that a little bit and what I'm going to do about it. Which is basically, I'm going to make some changes, and then I'm going to consider lots of what they said for my newest pieces. That way, I'm going to be progressing forward, and not just uh, remaining stagnant.